1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll start there, but that's not where we're going to end up. The title of the sermon this morning is Failures in Maintenance. Failures in Maintenance. I'm not talking about you, John, your success in maintenance. (laughs) But the title of the sermon is Failures in Maintenance. We'll get to the scripture in a second, but first I want to share with you a concept Something that's taught in the Word and shown throughout the Word. And it's an encouraging word this morning. This is what I wrote. The Bible and the inspiration of it was written in such a way that it does not cover up or gloss over the faults of the great men and women found therein. God did not do this to belittle or bring down the power or the supernatural inspiration of the Word. But what He did is He brought it forth to show forth his power. Amen. So when you read from Genesis to Revelation and cover to cover and back and forth, you will find all the failures and all the warts and all the shortcomings of the men and women of God. And God didn't leave them out and He left them in there for a purpose. One reason, a small reason, is so that you and me can be encouraged. Amen. Because they were like us. They weren't special supernatural humans. You know, they weren't Marvel or DC Comics. They weren't something special to the point where they had supernatural powers to believe God and walk with God. They were just like you and I. They were touched with the same infirmities, the same weaknesses, the same likes and dislikes, the same problems. In 1 Corinthians, the very first chapter, in verse 25, it says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for you see your calling, brethren and sistren, How that not many wise men after the flesh and not many mighty and not many noble and not many are called. But God has chosen the foolish things, you and I, Mm -hmm. to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world, you and I, to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, that's you and me. The things which are despised, God has chosen. Yes, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are that no flesh would glory in His presence. And that last line that says, no flesh would glory in His presence, that's why He shows you the faults and the shortcomings of the men and women He used in such mighty ways. So that no flesh can glory in His presence. Do mighty things for God, but He'll do a work in you that you still remember. Oh, but I was the base thing. I was the weak thing. I was the foolish thing. So that your flesh doesn't get puffed up. You know it was God that did the work in you. Think of all the not- notable mighty ones in the word. And I, when I was preparing, I was thinking, and man, they were just coming, bam, ba, bam, ba, bam, ba, bam. All these men and women that really messed up. That were really messed up. The people that were not the ones that maybe we would think to use. But let me just give you a few examples of the, the key players in the word of God that we talk about and that we know of. But yet, they were weak, and they were beggarly in the things of the earth, and they fell, and they faltered, and they sinned, and they messed up. But God still used them. Noah heard God. Noah was used to save his family and to replenish the entire earth. Again, right? Noah was used. He saved his family, but that same family is the one that found him drunk and naked in a cave. Right? Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And he didn't enter into the promised land because he struck a a rock and he misrepresented the entire heart of God to the people. And he lost his temper. Most humble, that always gets me, the most humble man on the planet didn't get to go in because he misrepresented the heart of God. But God used him. He's one of the patriarchs of the faith. Israel's name was changed because he was a deceiver and he was a man that was prone to fear. Jacob. He was prone to fear, in his, and he's the lineage of Jesus Christ. Prone to fear, and his name meant, you're a liar. But God used him. David was called a man after God's own heart. Wrote psalms and poems and songs and beautiful, and we run to them. I'm going through a hard time. I turn to the psalms, and I start reading what David wrote. Murderer, adulterer, numbered the people full of pride. Isn't that amazing? And 
God still uses them. Amen. Still. No limit to how much he used them. Mm -hmm. You see, it's like you and I. Isaiah's called to be a prophet. And what had happened to, happen to him before he could speak? You got to get his lips burned. Filthy, ugly. You need to be right. Peter was called a rock. His name means a rock. He was strong. He was boisterous through the word. He loved Jesus. Loved him. But denied him. Sliced the guy with a sword. Mm -hmm. This man who comes to Jesus and says, you shouldn't die. You should go to the cross. And Jesus is like, you're being used by the devil, brother. The same weaknesses in them. The same failures that we see. James and John wanted to nuke people. They wanted to call down fire from heaven and nuke them. They wrote some of the New Testament, but that's what they wanted to do. There's faults and there's failures. It's encouraging, is it not? You read about it, you start reading, wait a second. They weren't superhumans. There wasn't some special degree of Holy Ghost that they got that I didn't get. And that's what the Word does. It comes and it begins to talk to us about and show us these things to show us that it's all about Jesus Christ living in you. It's all about the Spirit of God that makes it happen. It's not the men and women. Listen to this in James chapter 5. Confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman will availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. He was a man of like passions, just like you and I. Elijah, a man of miracles, a man of faith, a man that walked with God. A man that hid in a cave, mm -hmm. wanting to die. Mm -hmm. Scared to death of a devil-filled woman. Yeah. Same yeah. guy. That's the same guy. Saying, oh God, kill me. I can't go on. Just take my life. It's too much. Yeah. After he just slew all the prophets of Baal and killed 400 of them. And fire fell from the sky. He goes and he hides in a cave. Oh God, I can't do this anymore. Just take me out. I don't have any faith. I can't do this anymore. Like passions. Like passions. When you think of the mighty ones, I think of Elijah. Say it and it happens, raising the dead, doing all kinds of mighty miracles. And then we find him hiding in the cave full of fear. Like passions, just like you and I. You see, who was the father of faith? Abraham. We call Abraham the father of faith, right? He was the one that believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, right? He believed God and accounted him as righteousness. But I'm going to show you, he believed God. Then he doubted. Then he believed. And then he doubted. Yeah. It went back and forth and back and forth. The, f the Righteousness? Yes. There was righteousness there when he believed God. But he wasn't a superhuman either. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll read about... You don't believe me. So let's go there and read about it. In, in Hebrews chapter 11. Be a Berean. Test me. See if I know what I'm talking about. In Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 8. The hall of faith, you know, chapter 11 talks about faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So look at verse 8 in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, by faith, when Abraham was called to go out into a place where he should receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing where he went. By faith, he sojourned in a land of promise in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one. And him as good as dead, so many as the stars in the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. So does that mean... That Abraham and Sarah were perfect. God only used them because they're righteous, right? Mm -hmm. No. God only used them because they had it figured out. No. When Sarah first heard she was going to have a baby. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what happened. Yeah, right. And the angel goes, why did she laugh? Who, who am I? What am I? What are you, what are you laughing at? I come from the presence of the Most High God. And I'm telling you, 
So no, Abraham and Sarah weren't perfect. Remember the title of the sermon? Failures in Maintenance? Just remember. So go all the way back to Genesis. Because you notice how in Hebrews, let's turn to the book of Genesis. You notice how in Hebrews, it doesn't talk about their faults. It talks about their faith. But guess what Genesis does? It talks about their faults. Not to belittle. Not to bring down but to lift up the power of God. How it is about God. How it's about what God does and people that say, yes, Lord. Amen. Or people that maintain. Now, the writer of Hebrews, he didn't include it. I think it was Paul. I think Paul wrote Hebrews. But he didn't include their faults. He just talked about how God did something amazing in them. But look in Genesis chapter 12. Go to Genesis chapter 12. In the first verse, and it talks about Abraham. Abram right now, but he will become Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and I'll make your name great. And you shall be a blessing and I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed from the Lord who had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So go down to verse 7. And it says, Then the Lord again appeared to Abram and said, Unto your seed or your descendants I'll give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had what? Appeared to him. So the Lord gives him a command and tells him what to do. And then on many occasions, the Lord, what? Appears to him. Stands right in front of him and talks to him. Communicates with him. See, there's significance in that. God appears to him. God speaks to him like an audible voice. Do this. Don't do that. I will do this for you. And then appears to him and speaks to him. God, so God only speaks to the perfect ones, right? No. God only speaks to the ones that are self-righteous? No. God came and spoke right to him. And I am such a firm believer, this got buried deep down in my heart. I never lost it when I first got saved. And you know how it goes? It goes like this. If he did it for them, he'll do it for me. Amen. If he did it with them, he'll do it for me. Amen. He's not a respecter of persons. Just because he spoke to this man doesn't mean he was spe he'll speak to me. Just because he showed this person, it wasn't just special, I'm only going to show this person. He'll show you. It's powerful. He spoke to him face to face. He appeared before him and said, this is what you have to do. But look what happens in verse 10. Go down to verse 10. And there was a famine in the land. Remember, God had appeared to him and spoke to him. In verse 10 of chapter 12. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there. For the famine was bad. And it came to pass. When he was to enter Egypt. He said unto Sarai his wife. Behold. You are a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass. When the Egyptians shall see you. They'll say this is his wife. And they'll kill me. And they will enslave you. So I say pray thee. Say you're my sister. And it will be well with me for your sake. And my soul shall live because of you. The man just saw God. <laughs> just saw God. Right. And now he's scared to death. You pretend you don't know me. I'll pretend we're not really married. So that I can escape with the skin on my back. How's that sound? You deny me and deny what we are. So we can skate through this. Without the Lord. We'll figure it out. Me and you. Yes. Let's put our heads together. We'll get through this mess. God just talked to him. The God of all the universe says, your seed will be like the stars in the heavens. And immediately, what does he do? He hatches up a plan in his mind. Let's lie to get through this. He's full of fear. He tells his wife to, to lie. Deny who you are. Deny who you belong to. I'll deny who you are. I'll deny that you're my wife just because I'm afraid I might die. The father of faith. So he goes down. And this is how the rest of the story goes. Sure enough, 
They see her. She's a haughty bubalati, so they grab her. The Egyptian king grabs her and says, I'm going to make her my wife. And he keeps his, you know, what does Barty Fife say? Take a lock, you know? So he has his mouth shut. He doesn't say anything. And all of a sudden, what starts to happen? Tragedy and travesty and misery and things start getting cursed. I will curse those who curse you. I will bless those who bless you. It's amazing how God still keeps a covenant with somebody who's a liar. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so things start befalling, besetting this king. And he says, Abram, what gives? You know, I bring your, your sister to me. Like, she's my wife. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? You would have spared us all. And he says, get out of here. Take her and go. He didn't get killed. But there's full of fear, you know, the father of faith. But that's the whole point of the message. That's the whole encouraging part. Because that's you and I. Back and forth. Here and there. Up and down. But God is like this. Amen. Amen. Keeps his covenant. Still loves you. Still is faithful. Doesn't leave. I will never forsake you. I will never leave. So, as if it can't get worse, you know, it goes on. And the Lord comes to him. The Lord comes to him in a vision. Go to chapter 15. Chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. And your exceeding great reward. So the Lord is speaking to him in a vision or a dream in 15.1. And Abram says, Lord, here's the question mark. What will you give me? Seeing I have, I'm childless and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. God appears and says, this is what I'm going to do. Tell me how. Why? How can this come to be? Isn't that funny how that always happens in the word? It shows something in the human heart, doesn't it? Remember when, when she's about to have John the Baptist and they come and John, John's dad, mute. How will this be, God? How can you make this happen? I stand in the presence of Almighty God. It's going to happen because I'm telling you it's going to happen. Amen. You cannot talk for, until he's born now. Thank you very much mm-hmm. for not believing me. And he was mute and he couldn't talk. What is his name? He has to write down his name is John. Because God told me that's what his name's going to be. It's the same thing all through the word. It started way back in Genesis and it goes all the way to the New Testament, doesn't it? God says something and we go, (laughs) how could that even happen, God? How could you do that? Your word says it. It's amazing how that unbelief starts to just come up and bubble up in your heart and it starts to, and it comes out your mouth. You're just unbelieving. When because I, isn't that funny how we do that with our kids? I do that with my kids. <laughs> why, Dad? Because I said. Because I said so. That's why. You know, you, you pull the judge dread. Because I'm the law. You know, I am the law. You know, it's the same thing with the Lord. He is the law and he says it. And it's as good. It's good. His word is law. He keeps his word. When he, what he says goes. But it's funny how... Abram questions it. The father of faith, mind you, whose faith was credited to him as righteousness. He believed God and God credited him as righteousness. But what we see through the way is a lot of doubt, don't we? But what we hear about him in Hebrews is that he had faith and that he believed God. His wife believed God and they walked with God. That's what we hear in the New Testament. But God doesn't hide to us the faults and the frailty and the failing and the questions And the doubt. He doesn't hide those things from us. Why? As a testimony to us, we're the same. You're the same. You can walk with Him the same. You can hear Him. We don't have to fall victim to the same doubts and the fears and the questions. We can choose to stand. We can choose, no, you said it, I believe it, I'll receive it. So He comes to Abram and He says, Behold, Thou hast given me no seed, and the one in my house is my heir, my servant. And God comes to him saying again, This will not be your heir, but he that comes forth of your own bowels from you, your seed shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and he said, Look toward the heaven, tell the stars. That means number, count them if you're able. So your seed shall be. 
And it says, he believed the Lord and it was accounted to him for righteousness. What comes next? Ishmael. Yeah. Ishmael comes next. Isn't that amazing? God makes covenant with him. God includes the touchability and the humanness of those he used. He used them. You say, you know, I've prayed or I've asked God and nothing happened. Elijah was a man of like passions and he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three years and it didn't rain. It's the same with you and I. It's about truly taking him at his word. Receiving what he says and knowing. The word of the Lord comes to him, then doubt. God speaks to him, then doubt. Then faith, then doubt. Then trying to make it happen. Isn't that funny? How that is like you and I. And he says to him, he goes on, he says, I brought you out and I'll give you this land. And he turns and he says, God, how will I know? How will I inherit it? How? It's God says, this will be, and then a question. And this will be, and then a question. Doubts and questions again. But you know what I believe as reading this and studying this? Man sees the outward appearance, right? Mm -hmm. God sees the heart. Amen. And even when Abram's questioning him, mm -hmm. I believe deep down in his heart, he's ready to believe. Yeah. He wants to believe. He wants to receive. He wants to go forward. Let it be. Like Mary said, let it be according to me according to your word. Amen. You shall be with child from the Holy Spirit. And she says, let it be to me according to your word. See, I taught a long time ago about the correct response when God tells you something. When God came and he spoke to Mary, not like her cousin who doubted and was then made mute when John the Baptist was coming, God came to her and spoke to her, you'll be with child. I believe her question, how will this be since I've not known a man? I believe she was young. I believe it was an honest, pure question of, uh... Yeah. What? I really don't understand. I'm not questioning your ability or your power, but I don't get it. Right. And then later she says, let it be to me according to your word. In other words, whatever you say. Amen. Whatever you say, God, I'll believe it. So, doubt and questions again. Now in verse fifth, or chapter 15, go down to verse 9. Go down to verse 9. <clears throat> I, I, believe, I believe that God saw deep desire, a passionate desire in him to believe and to walk out that belief. There is a hunger inside of him to take God at his word, even though there are questions about impossibilities and questions about tactics and there's questions about how this will be. I believe in his heart it was burning. I want to believe God. I want to walk with him. So in verse 9, God turns to Abram and he says, Take a heifer of three-year-olds and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. <clears throat> and he took all these and he cut them in half. He divided them in the midst. And he laid each piece against another, but the birds he didn't divide. When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away, or Abram. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleet fell on Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that's not theirs and shall serve them and shall be afflicted for 400 years. And also a nation whom they shall serve I will judge and afterwards they will come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace and thou shalt be buried in good old age. And the fourth generation they'll come out hither for the iniquity of the Amorites is not full. And it came to pass when the sun went down it was dark. Behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces the same day the Lord made covenant with Abram saying unto thee unto thy seed have I given this land and the river of Egypt unto the great river and the Euphrates in verse 18 in the same day the Lord made covenant with Abram God did it God did it 
doubt, fear, patriarchs, men of faith. Who made covenant with who? God made covenant with him. Abram didn't make covenant with God. Abram is fallen. Abram can't keep a covenant with God. What's that covenant saying? If I don't keep this covenant, let me be cut in two just like these animals. That's what it meant. Walk through these pieces. It was a custom. You cut all the animals right in half. You put them on each side. The man who makes covenant walks down the path in the middle. If I don't keep my word to you, cut me right in half like these animals. That's what it meant. If Abram walked through there, he can't keep covenant. God did it. God made it with him. He would fail. He would falter. He would fall. But God would not. In the same day, the Lord made covenant with Abraham, saying to your seed, I will do this. It's God's power. It's his love. It's his condensation there. His condescension that he came down from heaven, humbled himself and made covenant with you and I, just like God did with him. I didn't help Jesus on the cross. I didn't hold Jesus on the cross. I didn't hinder Jesus from the cross. He came down and he did it all by himself and he didn't need my my help or my aid or my my hurrah go Jesus he didn't mean me being a fanboy he did it because it was his will his power and he made covenant with you and I because of the will of the father and his blood came and his blood was shed for that covenant we fail we falter we fall we mess up and the covenant still remains doesn't it God's covenant with Abraham, it remained. His name got changed to Abraham and his covenant continued. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. Your seed will be like the stars in the heavens. Even though you fail, you falter, you make a Hagar, you make an Ishmael, I'll still continue in my covenant because I don't lie. I don't fail. I keep my word. How many men and women did not keep their word? We're not super righteous. Just as he did with you and me, Jesus came down and he, he walked to the cross. He said, no one takes my life. I give it willingly. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. This is what the Father has told me. Remember? Jesus did it of himself. So Abram's role, what's your role? It's not works. It's not human perfection. It's not extracurricular holiness. It's not what you can earn or try to make God love you more or try to earn a covenant. It's not even about you trying to omit sin from your life and live in a bubble and wash your mind all day long and trying to keep yourself from that. That'd be good, but it's not practical. We have a world that we live in and we have jobs and we have family and we have flesh. That's why Jesus' blood was shed now and forever. Once and for all. But this is the crux of the message. And this is what God really spoke to me. And this encouraged the snot out of me. I got so excited. What's your role? What's my role? So God comes to him and he says, take a heifer and take these animals and split them in two. And he laid them on each side. And what's verse 11 say? He says, when the fowls came down upon the carcass, Abram drove them away. That's your job. If something comes to steal your faith, you shoo it away. You're not always going to maintain perfect faith. But when something comes to attack it, you shoo it away. No, 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 don't touch it. I choose to believe. No, these are supposed to be here for a reason. I'm supposed to believe for a reason. See, the doubts come. The fears, they'll come. It's not a matter of if, it's when. They come. You start to make covenant, you start to walk with Him. The fowls of the air, what's it represent the word of God? Demonic forces that come and attack you. Demonic forces that come to lie to you. You walk in faith and here come the birds of the air. What's your job? It's not to, I don't have to, I can handle this, I can fight. It's just to shoo them away. Don't touch my faith. I I am going to maintain my faith in my walk with God. That's what your call is. And you don't have to be superhuman to do it. You just have to be a person of like passions that loves him. It's the same. Because the same call for them. They were no different than us. What was his call during the time that God made covenant with him? I know you're a failure at maintenance in your faith. I know you're a failure at maintaining your faith. But what I want you to do is just shoo the birds away. 
walk it and shoo them away. Maintain that walk and that faith the best you can. And how do you do that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know how you shoo away all the birds of the air that come to steal? You eat it up. You keep yeah. reading and you read it and you read it. That's what builds faith. Mm-hmm. You know what builds our faith right now? Hearing about the men that had their faith built. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Builds your faith. Oh, wow. God did it for them. Oh, wow. Abram didn't make covenant with God. God made covenant with him. And when the birds came down, that was his job. To say, get off here. This is between me and the Lord. I'm going to believe. I choose to believe. Doubt and fear come. God understands. We have a high priest who's been touched with our affirmities so that he could understand. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ learned obedience by the things that he what? Suffered. Yes. Yes. Touched with our affirmities. Understands the weakness. Understands temptation. That's right. God understands. And he doesn't begrudge you. Oh, you blew it that time. It's not like the game of sorry. You don't get to the point and then somebody goes, boom, go back to the beginning. That's not how it works in the, in the walk with God. It works like that in my house when I play with my daughters and they love it. But no, it's not like that. It's not like that with the Lord. It's a process. It's a walk. And you know, I was thinking how we call it a walk with God. How we walk with God. He walks with us. We don't walk with him. He walks with us. Because it has nothing to do with your strength. Or your perseverance. Or your willpower. He walks with us. As we stumble and fall in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Towards the cross. And we go and we learn and we're sanctified. And there's a process and we mature and we learn and we grow. Mm -hmm. And we love him more. He walks with us. The Holy Spirit sums it up and he says, When the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. It's about maintenance. It's about maintaining your faith. It's about maintaining your faith. It's about maintaining it. And keeping faith. It's not about trying to add. Remember, I've talked about it before. Jesus said, if you have a mustard seed. Why do you say mustard seed? Itty bitty. And it's about maintaining the faith. Feeding. Feeding it. Believing. Choosing to believe. Even when it's hard. Even when the doubts come and the trials come. Financial problems come. And the family problems come. And the emotional problems come. And the physical problems come. It's about shooing away. Everything that would come down to try to steal your faith. It's not about you being a superhero and standing on the building having all faith. Having all things and knowing all things. Paul sums it up in faith, hope, and love. If you have hope and love, if you love him and you walk with him, it's not about possessing this one grand thing and, oh, now I'll skate through life. It's about maintaining it. That's why we're we're failures at maintenance, but it says without faith it's impossible to please him. And he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Where does faith come? By spending time with God. How do you combat lies? Spending time with God and his word. But nowhere in the Bible do we see you have to be perfect. Nowhere in the Bible do we see you have to be maintain perfect and complete righteousness in your own strength in order for God to use you or speak to you. Nowhere. You can't find it. It's not there. That's why he talks about using the weak, the foolish, the based, different vessels. We all look different. He said God uses cracked vessels that can hold water. Amen. He uses ugly vessels that hold water. Not the gold encrusted with gems who just love to sparkle. He uses the old clay ones that are beat up, but they still hold water and they pour out. It's not about your perfection. Listen to me very carefully. God does not hear you. He does not hear your prayers and your supplications based on what you think your merit is. It is not based. He does not respond to you based on your good works. 
God does not move mountains on your behalf or give you breakthroughs because of how good you've been or how much you read the Bible. That is not what the Bible says. That's not how it works. It's by maintenance, faith. Okay, God, I believe you. Condemnation is an amazing thing. The devil, he's had a long time to practice, so he knows what he's doing. Condemnation is amazing because you mess up. He wants to put heavy weights on you. You can't come to God. You can't go to church. You can't pray. You can't do this. the very thing that's the antidote. That's what condemnation does. It keeps you from the very thing that will get you back on track and make you feel better and make you right with God. It's amazing how, oh, I can't pray. I messed up. I faltered. I failure in maintenance. I wasn't maintaining my faith. I don't believe him, so I just, I'll just stay home. I just won't read the Bible. I just won't go to church today because I'm just too ugly. Oh, I've been there. I've been there where I didn't want to be around the people of God because I knew how filthy I was. When that's the very place God wants you to go. Amen. Where he's telling you through his word, go. Confess your faults to one another. Fellowship with one another. Show love to one another. Let me speak to you through others. Let me show you I still love you through others. But no, I'm going to stay home and watch Netflix. Because I've struggled so much in my flesh. God does not find our merit based on what we do or what we think. What did, we, what did Abram do with God's covenant that God made with him? What did he do with it? What was his role? Shooing away? And what else did he have to do? Receive it. Amen. That's it. Just receive it. It wasn't, he didn't have to chant some special prayer or say something that marvelous or get down on his knees and grovel on it. It was just receive it. Just believe it. Just re- and it's the same with Jesus Christ with you and I. You don't earn your way to the cross. You just... Receive it. Yes. Okay, God, I can't do it. Yes. I'm too weak. I'm too foolish. I'll mess it up again. Mm-hmm. I just receive it and help me to not be a failure at maintenance, but just maintain my faith and shoo the birds away and walk in it. That's powerful, isn't it? It's not about all you do. How far did the prodigal run to his father? It wasn't the prodigal that ran. That's right. It was the father that ran. That's right. It's the same with you and I. You don't come to him and, you know, you don't have to walk on your knees a certain amount to make them bloody, to bring some sort of burnt, dead, ugly offering to God. You just receive it. Listen to this. This is the last verse. Why art thou so cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for sh- shall I yet praise him for the help of his countenance? Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I'll remember you from the land of Jordan. Deep calls upon deep at the noise of thy waterfalls. All thy waves and billows have gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and the night his song shall be with me. And my prayer unto the God of my life. What's David doing? Amen. He's shooing him away. That's exactly what he's doing. Why are you so cast down? Why are you depressed? Why are you so full of unbelief? Why are you faltering and failing in your maintenance? Hope in God. The help of my countenance. Yes. I'll yet praise him. Yes. Sometimes you've got to stir yourself up. Yes. And start reading the word again. Oh, wait a second. He does call me his beloved, doesn't he? That's right. Oh, wait a second. He did shed his blood for me. If it was just me, he still would have done it, wouldn't he? Amen. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. No. He's always been faithful to me. Right. He's always fulfilled his covenant to me. Yes. I hope you're encouraged.